Hello, Prananga, good afternoon. I uh, hope everyone's had a good weekend. Thank you for joining us. As usual, just going to go through a few checks to get started. Just a little bit slow getting moving there. So, yeah, everything seems fine. Right, um, a little bit later, possibly than normal, we just had a group in. So I was just finishing off with the group there and then setting everything up for the live stream. Um, this one that we're going to start with, I may get time to do more than one carve in today, but this one that we're starting with is similar to one that we did for a live stream a couple of weeks back. Um, what basically happened when, uh, when the other spoon that I was doing, when that was put up on the website, because it was going to um, America, so that's the easiest way for people to uh, arrange shipping and payment for their love spoon if, if it's going to America. Um, yeah, what actually happened is somebody saw the spoon and really liked the bees and the flower. And so they wanted something similar, but in a slightly different design. So they came in and we happened to have a group in when they came in. And so uh, we had to organize, uh, we had to design it while, whilst they were waiting. And here it is. And uh, yeah, so we're going to demonstrate how, how we're going to actually carve this one. Um, we're just starting off then, usual sort of process, doing our stop cuts. So just a few little stop cuts down into the wood itself. We're also then going to, yeah, all stop cuts. This is almost like grass that sort of effect in and around the daffodil and um we got the daffodil itself so it's just basically initially getting starting to look at the depth getting the depth on the different parts of the uh of the spoon we're uh we, we've got this one here we're working on a few different designs for people at the moment as well when it comes to the bespoke spoons but the other part to this demonstration, if things go well and we progress well, is to show you some of the other spoons we're going to be working on and they're more of our standard range. Reason for that then, we're starting to get low in terms of our online stock. It's not a, a, a Love Spoon Workshop crisis yet like... Uh, fuel and turkeys but um yeah we're trying to uh, sort of keep that we always try and keep everything up in stock online so we're going to be having a little look some of the ones that one there possibly um well let us know in the comment section everyone watching if i do get through this one what would you like to see us demonstrate i've got the spooning hearts Celtic Eternity sign, entwined hearts, so that's with a twist with the heart side by side, or the anchor. So let us know in the comments section which one of those would you like to see us demonstrate if I can get through this particular spoon fairly, uh, fairly swiftly. Now, as you can see, we continue to build up the stop cuts. So those stock cuts are what we will use then for the petals. This is like a piece of grass that's going behind the flower. That is the stem of the daffodil. Uh, good day. Good day to the carver. Hope the weekend went well. It sounds like you had a positive weekend, so glad to hear that. Hope the, uh, hope the sunburn's calming down too. Bit of after sun. I'm always piling on the factor 50 whenever I'm out in the sun and then plenty of after sun afterwards. Oh, hello Dee. I love the, the Celtic, you call it a tri, tri, tri We We call it um, Celtic eternity sign, probably because I can't say what you said. Uh, let's go, let's go Celtic. Okie dokie, we'll go with the Celtic one. Um, brilliant. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll show you how to carve that one in a minute. Um, that one's going to be a challenge as well, because if you look, there's a couple of little knots, but I thought, it, it, to be honest with you, 
Like sometimes, I got a little knot in the bowl as well. Sometimes we don't use things like that in our online shop because everyone wants the wood clean. But it's such a nice piece of wood that I thought I'm going to use it. And if somebody's not happy with it, then there we are. So so be it. But I thought it was such a beautiful piece of wood that I'd like to like to use it. So you can see, yeah, we're just getting this depth, pushing the the parts of the design that are going to be more in the background. We're pushing them right back. Get them out of the way so we haven't got to worry about them. So it's just getting that initial depth on some of these different parts of the carving. And you may notice that the lower part I've sanded as, as sort of as far as I could when it comes to taking it in the, the paper away from in and around that bowl. Um, I have it on my neck, but not on my cheeks. Yeah, we, uh, whenever I'm in Spain, I, I still manage to, uh, I still manage to get a bit of, uh, bit of colour in the sun. But I've always got the Factor 50 and I'm always using the, uh, the one designed for the, for the children because my skin is fair, fairly fair and I tend to burn in the sun, I'm afraid. So always Factor 50 and then sun cream afterwards. So you can see we're just dropping initially. It's basically the same processes. I'll carve in the one direction as much as I can. So we'll start off carving in this direction. I will then turn the spoon around in the vise and I will carve it back in the opposite direction. That's a little quirk, unusual little bit when it comes to my own carving. Simple reason for it is because I sit down to carve. That tends to be the way I organize things. Dad does it differently because he stands to carve, so. If he wants to carve something the other way, he just goes around the other side of the spoon and starts carving. I find the knots are character and will be more challenging to the carver. Absolutely. Move the overall piece. So is that like much harder to complete? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, our cells, if, if there's sort of a big knot, um, or if there's a knot that we think, oh, that's going to be particularly challenging, then we may mark out on another part of the wood, but I thought it was such a lovely piece of wood and they're only little knots. I thought it added to the overall character of the spoon. And sometimes what we do is, instead of just putting that then in our online shop, just in case, we, um, we put it in the workshop here so people would buy it as it's seen, as opposed to the website where generally people want it to look as close to the picture as possible. Thomas Wood carves in the background. Could you do me a favour, dude? Yeah. Um, I've forgotten to plug my plug in, which probably isn't making any difference. Do you have, it, which have one? any issues with tear out? If so, how do you usually deal with it? Um, yeah, great. Brilliant. Fantastic. I can see my computer screen properly now. I forgot to plug the computer in, so I was looking in the dark. Um, tear outs. Do we have problems with tear outs? I don't know what a tear out is. I would imagine what it is with some of the terms we're not always familiar with. We're not the, we're not the most up on uh, different sort of terms, different technical terms on that front. But I'm imagining tear out is where the, the grain, where it tears as you're carving. Um, generally, a couple of things we'd sort of say, if that is what you're referring to when you, when you refer to tear out, um, because this is the thing, there are terms that get created. Yeah. Uh, sharp gouge, well, so could check, that, check could, your gouges. Could that be a tear out there? What's that then? You see that? Little, little bit on the candle? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah, um, tearing out on the grate. I mean, a couple of things. Yeah, it's, it's working, it's working with the wood. So if you're sort of battling against it, that, that can cause, you know, tearing, that sort of thing. Having a good quality sharp gouge, appropriate wood, because certain woods, uh, when you don't get a clean edge, right, yeah, it is, carving across, across grain. So it's when you don't get a clean cut. Yeah, you do. And this is where we're working in seasoned hardwoods. And the reason for that is because they do cut more cleanly. 
So a lot of a lot of carving is done in um, green wood has become popular, and I, I see a lot of people carving in softwoods more more so now basically. When you when you're going across the grain, then I mean that's the first thing is to avoid carving across the grain as much as you can. But it's it's those basics really, isn't it? it, it I wouldn't say there's any sort of trick to it. Good sharp gouge, good timber, well seasoned timber, good quality hardwoods, and as much as you can carve, you know, with with the grain. Um, and if you do have bits that, that the grain grain switch direction mid cut and a chunk goes, ah, oh yeah, that happens. Carve it deeper. Um, I mean, there's also the other aspect where you'll be carving something. Like mahogany is a good example. Some mahoganies I've carved, they actually carve backwards. So you have to forget everything that you've ever learnt. If a piece of wood is tearing in a particular, when you're carving it in a particular direction, try and carve it in different directions and see which way it carves best. Don't follow the textbooks too much, basically, because um, they're great in theory and they give you a good basis, but it's, it's getting the cleanest cut possible so yeah, I mean that is a common, that's a common carving thing is to have, you know, the grain tearing. You just have to find a solution and find the best way um, to carve it. I'd be interested, did if, it, have you got any thoughts on that? Any advice? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just let you know. Um, Thomas Woodcarver is going to come and give a, a penny for his thoughts. Um, his, his tuppence on that particular subject but yeah I, that's that's a lot of it is as much as you can work with the grain um, and also have your gouges nice and sharp another part that may influence that is how you've marked things out initially so if you've marked out sort of cross grain and if you haven't really looked at your wood before you start your project then you're making it more difficult as you do in your project so, well, that's consideration. It's not exactly tear out this, but it is relevant. Um, one of the things that happens here, you carve the face of the spoon, right? Yeah. And at, at the moment, you're carving the bee yeah. and the flower. And so, you do that and you finish the face, but then it's the backside of the spoon now. Which I, which I will carve as well. Which sometimes you carve. Well, I, I carve it if it's on a, a bespoke spoon, if it's on a spoon over a certain That's value, right. because it's the but amount of time what I, I spend. You know, it'd be interesting to find what people think about it, because um, well, ideally, I do it on all spoons, but I just can't afford exactly, and that's the time. that's the issue here. Is how far do you go for your love spoon? Technically, you see, because this tradition dates back way back to the seventeenth century, it would be the young man usually carving the spoon for his girlfriend. Uh, and then eventually it would be maybe the husband carving it for the girlfriend. Well, for, for the wife, not the girlfriend. <laughs> so, what's, uh, what's your husband up to there? Well, that's, that's the tradition, but I mean, things have moved on from there, haven't they? They have, but we still like to try and keep it as authentic as we can. So, the love spoon, 99 times out of 100, is hung on the wall. So you're not going to see the back of the spoon. So do we leave the back of the spoon? Um, and again, it comes back down to the scroll saw, the quality of the blade, whether, because we use those number nine, the, the blade, you, you've got a reverse tooth on it. So it's helping not to... Um, push the grain back, which is what you were referring to, this uh, tearing of the grain. Yeah. So, I mean, if I can push this one in front of you, yeah. you can see 
That's the back of this spoon. Um, so it's very sharp around there. So there's a decent finish. But you carve in the front. So I'm wondering, you know, should we? It'll be down to individual preference. Well, base the quality of the spoon. But it's important um, because... It's as the carver's just said to you, I agree with the carver with what the carver said here. He's just said it's a very brave husband that would be carving a love spoon for his girlfriend. I agree. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree. And as well, thank you, Dee, for for the uh, for the positive feedback on that. Uh, it reminds me of the the toast. Here's here's to our wives and lovers. May the two never meet. <laughs> yeah, this is this is where we we get into. Um, <laughs> Thomas Wood that's Carver. Why, that's As I say, the you nice... don't normally put me very much on this. Uh... No, the nice thing with the love spoon now is that the traditions developed and they're carved for all sorts of different occasions and all sorts of different people carve that. And that that's that is the nice thing with it. it it's it's such an open thing, um, and it, you know if you're interested in the love spoon tradition, fantastic, get in there and, and get carving with it with the love spoons. Um, what what I think you're referring to is yeah. A lot of it comes down to when it comes to the finish is satisfying your yourself. What also you've got to consider, what Dan's referring to, quite often. Um, I mean, I've got quite good lighting because I'm doing live stream and things like that. I always put my sort of my studio lights. I've got a Roto light, um, and I always put that on for quite a lot of the carbon I'm doing. So my lighting's good, but at different angles you can't see certain things. So when you go to finish them. What happens when, when we go to finish something, you'll notice little things. Yeah. Yeah, I've got, I've got, getting, back I've got to, getting back to the tear out though, I would focus on, on the basics and a lot of it comes down to um, how, how you're sort of interacting with the wood. So if you're finding that you're getting tear out as a regular thing and it's, it really is an issue, because it, it happens to everyone. We all have you know, carvings that you're doing where the grain tears and things like that, that happens to everyone. And if anybody says they haven't... Well, here you have... Right? There we are, there's a it knot. It isn't a tear out, but it's a knot. Okay? Yeah. And so... So we can fill that. I'm, I'm filling it, right? But interestingly, occasionally, as you said, because of the lighting, we'll let one of those go through. Yeah. And somebody come and buy it, and then you point out to them, oh, there's a knot on there. And they go, yeah, I like that. That's right. I like that. That's why I but, like it. You know, so it it's strange because again, it's down to the individual. Do you do you let that one go with a with a what I would call a void where the knot has sort of uh, part of the knot has come out? Well, this that's a good example. This love spoon that Dad's talking about there, um, that is on our website. And for instance, now if you send in a Ninety percent plus. If you sent that out on our website, I don't think ninety percent of people wouldn't worry about it. But you get that ten percent who would yeah, be who yeah. wouldn't be very happy. And, 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 and so we wouldn't work. send it. We wouldn't send that out. Yeah, in that condition. So I mean, there we are. I'll ask you on that one there. I'm going to show Thomas Woodcarver that one there, um, and I'll get his opinion on it. Do you think that would be acceptable for the website? There we go. And I got a follow up for for him on that one there. Well. It, it is acceptable, right, but it's that, that. it's that ten percent yeah. that may query it. Yeah, and the reason being is because it's basically you've, you've got a knot in the spoon in in the spoon, and we have got a couple of knots across there. Yeah. Basically, I I saw it. I thought it's nice. It's a lovely piece of wood, and yeah. I carried on with it. Um, my my follow up was going to be because if you're not happy with it, you'll have to go mark another one out because you haven't got any on the website. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it's it's. Basically, this is this is the sort of decisions you're, you're taking. When it comes to things like tear out, going back to it, in and around knots, they can be tricky, those areas to carve. Yeah. So for instance, I will bevel that edge, but I'll be cautious when I'm beveling that. So that's the sort of thing that can cause tear out. The other thing then, if you've got a diagonal grain when you mark it, again, that, that could be possible problems when it comes to you know carving. And what I always find, because I'll be carving away and I will, I'll pull a chunk of wood out sometimes when I'm carving, but I'm, you get so used to it on a daily basis, you don't even think about it. 
and then find the direction of the grain where it works the best. Right. Now, I hope this will come across for people. Right. I've got, I've got a word, rustic, and it's going to be, this now is a possibility, and this is how Dave and I work together here now. On the, on the website, okay, I've just... You want to, you want to launch a rustic range now, do you? We're going to possibly, maybe, you see, because people like knots and natural... So maybe we can experiment with one of our spoons and, and if, call it a rustic. Well, uh, that'll probably fit in with like collector's corner. So we can yeah. do a love spoon instead of, yeah. instead of tying me down to making another 50 spoons. Um, it, yeah. what, what, what we could do is to do in collector's corner, yeah. rustic oak. Yeah. But you see, it's, um, it's satisfying that need for people who want something totally different. Because yeah. we tend to, you know, <laughs> Again, it's because of the joinery background. You couldn't make a door with a bit of a gap or a window with, with a, a draft. It had, to, it had to fit. And so our spoons tend to be um, very few knots. We make them from, for, on the internet, we either make them out of oak or mahogany. All seasoned, and, all and seasoned wood. Yeah. So all we seasoned avoid wood. that. So, so it's that, all stable. So that we, we don't want to... Um, cause a problem where somebody says, oh, look, they sent me a spoon. It's got a great big knot in the heart. You know? I'm thinking of different examples now with this question of this tear out. You think of different situations. I always think, like, for instance, Sapili. Sapili, yeah. I don't know if everyone's worked in Sapili or not, or not, or pardon the pun. Um, the, um, but in Sapili, you'll get the grain going in different directions. Yeah. And sometimes I find in Sapili that I will, I will start carving, like for instance, I may carve up the, up the edge on the, on the one side and a, and a chunk comes out. Yeah. And it, now when you're learning to carve, that can be quite off-putting and you're thinking, oh, what do I do? Now I just instinctively turn it around, carve it the other way, mm. and sometimes you turn it the other way and you'll, you'll have even more problems carving yeah. it. Yeah. And so you have to go back to the original direction, but what you do you take out a smaller cutting, a smaller shaving. No? That's what I would do, is to take out... Don't yeah. take out such a yeah. large amount. Yeah. Take out smaller amounts. Yeah. So that's another thing to consider if you're having problems with that particular thing, is to reduce the amount that you're actually cutting out, you know, in e each cut. Um, and it's finding what suits you, what works best. The wood be very open to learning from the wood itself the wood will teach you so much these are so i like the rustic idea uh, things these days are the two stamped out yeah and perfect i love the unique and natural aspects that come from from the wood yeah absolutely um you know it, it's that is you know the more individuality yeah, you can I, have I, the I better think that would be a selling point absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah that but that's something you could consider when it comes to tear out is um if, if it is sort of, you know, you're, you're having it rip in like that. I'd be interested to know, yeah, uh, I'll ask, I'll ask Dee, what wood are you using? Because that may, that may give us some indications on if you are having an issue with that. I don't know. From, where, where did I take it from? That would have been there. It was there. Yeah. Um, so if you are having problems with that, 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 it can sometimes be down to the wood itself. Um, you know, methods. Wood, tools, technique, that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing uh, I, I found certainly when I was learning to carve, if you had, um, as you mentioned, what do you call it? A tear bite? Tear out. Tear, tear out. out. Yeah. If you, if you had something like that in wood, it meant that you had to carve it a little bit deeper. Yeah, carve it out. Which, <laughs> which often sort of improved. Yes. The product absolutely more depth on it and then that's what you know uh, maple mostly right that's interesting because maple that's a hard that's a that's actually a timber that you don't like carving isn't it dear? um you find that maple a bit hard yeah i get a bit old now so <laughs> well now i find it a bit hard and maple maple's really nice um it's a really pure color pure finish that you get on it However, it's physically quite demanding, isn't it? 
because it is it is hard stuff. Yeah. And also, if you get any tiny little nicks or anything like that in your in your gouges in your tools, oh, it doesn't have show up. Yeah. It shows everything because it's that paler colour. So yeah, there there are a few little bits, of, little challenging bits when it comes to using maple. Beautiful timber. I remember working in um, bird's eye maple, but that's challenging because with bird's eye maple, the grain is going all over the place. So yeah, they, they... But for us, sycamore, sycamore is a little bit easier. Is, is the is a sort of a another type of maple, isn't it? You know, that's you right. Sort of, uh... Carves nicely. Carves nicely. I I I like both maple and and sycamore, but. Um, the one thing I would say as well on, I don't know if it's the same for maple, but when it comes to sycamore, you always used to have a bit of a challenge when it comes to um, seasoning, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, seasoning. Some of it used to go very black and yeah. Pow powdery. Yeah, it, it didn't always season particularly well. So all things that, you know, for what you're describing, all things worth, worth considering. There we are. So you can see we're well... We're, we're making good progress on this one here. Um, working out that it's a nice piece of wood. What I did, I marked these out on the weekend and I selected what I thought was the cleanest piece of the wood for this particular, for this particular design. And then some of the other ones that we've got there um, came from the same piece. Let's have a little look. So we just got that. Little stop cut just going in there. Little stop cut just going in there. And we're gonna have to work out is this the right shape and size? But with with wood carving, it's trying different things, trying different methods, and learning different things. Um, I mean it, it takes it takes me back as well to you know, learning and things like that again with with different things like that. I, I didn't have any, like there are textbooks and things like that you, you can learn, but I, I never had any of that because a lot of that then would have been teaching the basics, but I had dad sort of telling me, no, 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 both hands behind the blade, cut away from yourself. You know, I had the basics. Um, I mean, my basics was was pretty much here's a piece of wood, have a go, really, and and making things. I think I think as well um, for flour, which we've done a few times. That was my absolute starting point. Sorry, you were going to say, dude. Um, yeah, what was I going to say as well? You said I think so. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, no, it's gone. Really. It's gone. Yeah, yeah um, but that's how you sort of taught myself, and I, I mean. My my two sons now they are they're learning. One is four, one is six. They're learning how to wood carve. They don't even realise it because they come in and they want to have a play on the bench. So we give them some gouges. We give them a give them some some tools. Give them a little project to have a go at. They enjoy it, but they are learning how to do it. But I always emphasise the only things I ever tell them. Both hands behind the blade, cut away from yourself, and make sure it is secured in the vice. So I set them up as safely as possible. Other than that, I just let them play about and do it. Because my youngest now was in here the other day, and he understands in terms of finding the cutting edge. So he can find the cutting angle on, on the gouge. It's come back to me now. It, it's the fact that a love spoon... <laughs> Yeah, it's so individual. Right, it is. Yeah, that when we're talking about the finish, um, I mean, we we are we are critical of the CNC yeah. fi finish. Um, but you know, we're also <laughs> we're also critical of um, foreign imports. Yeah, but at the same time. It's done very much to the individual, isn't it? Yeah, if, absolutely. If that's what the individual wants. If they want a, a, a love spoon that's been made on a CNC and they're happy with it, it's fine. That's that's what they want. You understand? 
Well, I think know. individuality is a big thing. I mean, yeah. this one here is an interesting one because I, I checked the notes for this spoon before I started. And there's been a, a specific request with this love spoon when it comes to the finishing. Do you remember that at all, Lou? Oh, I, I've forgotten about it, but now that you're saying... Yeah, the gentleman yeah. involved with this one who's asked us to do this one has asked us um, to leave it yeah. a more rustic yeah. finish. And, um, so it's quite and, interesting that rustic has cropped up a few times. And he who plays the piper calls the tune, in yeah. that sense. Exactly. At the same time... We also, if somebody... we ex well, we we explain to people that you know, in terms of the longevity of of it, we're, we're basically not going to be putting as many coats of shellac as we would normally do on here. It will be sealed, but not not in as as much as we normally would because he wants it a more. What would you say a more? Um, I don't know more. Uh, well, he, he doesn't, a less, want, he a doesn't less, want it shining. A less refined he finish. He doesn't want it reflecting yeah. the light. Yeah, he wants a less refined finish on it, yeah. which, um, that's no problem. We, we cater for his preference. That's what yeah. it's all about doing a bespoke spoon. It's all part of it, if that's what somebody wants. What we do, though, we explain longevity may not be as much. Oh, hello, Aubrey. Prananda, good to have you with us. Hope everything's well. Hope you had a good week. Hope you had a good weekend as well. We've been talking about tear out. Me and Dad have been learning new terminology. We're about the. Uh, we're not very. Um, we're not very up with terms and things like that, really. We. No. We. I mean, we we learnt. I think that's where ourselves we learnt by doing, and so. It was only in recent times I even learned the word stop cut. Yeah. Two words. Didn't know what a stop cut meant. Didn't, I could, I'd, I'd have done, when I learned the term stop cut, I'd have done tens of thousands of stop cuts. Yeah. Yeah. But the first time I heard it, I thought, what on earth, what on earth is a stop cut? So we're not very good in terms of the terminology because we never really learned from textbooks, well, did we? I'm, I'm back on the subject of the love screen, you see. One of the things that I'm, I, I try to do is not to have any sharp edges because, you know, you're talking about love and a yep. love spoon, you want it all smooth. So, but again, that's, that's my weird kind of thinking. It, well, co it, co it causes me, it's very frustrating sometimes because I wish that I wasn't as finicky and as, um, you know, well, there's, there's other things as well. Like we do, I mean, we do things like key rings. And I always think with a, I, I always think with a key ring, it's more important to take any sharp edges off a key ring than off a love spoon in yeah. some ways. Because because it it's, it's going to, as you said, you put a hole in your pocket or hurt your leg or something. So it is, the finishing is... I mean, there we are. All the sharp edges are off that one, right? Yeah. However, I don't know how long I've been... That's talking. tear out. That's tear out in there. Yeah, that's right. So I've taken the other side to match it up. Yeah. Okay. However, mm -hmm. that spoon sells for seven, when it's finished seven shellac, pounds and ninety nine pence. I do nearly believe. enough eight pounds. So that particular one, <laughs> we're, we're not really the time I've spent on that one. I'm losing I, money. Th those are a good example when it comes to things like tear out because. Um, You'll have one, <laughs> you'll have one um, where you'll have an issue with it and you, you'll spend ages, you'll spend three times the amount of time on one than you will on all the others. So all sorts of different things happen when you're carving. Yeah. If you have things like that though, that's where you develop your experience. If you're having issues with tear out, go through it. I would say go through it systematically and look what you think the issues could be. Is it the sharpness or even the quality of your tools? Yeah. Is it the woods? Is it the seasoning? Um, and then start looking, is it how you've marked your project out? Is it your carving? Um, learn, that's, that's what it's all about. Learn, figure out what it is. Um, I mean, that's, you know, it, it is such a fantastic, it's such a fantastic material to work in. It's such a fantastic yeah. process. Yeah. We, I mean, you know, we get asked why why are we doing YouTube and stuff like that. Well, we've learned so much 
from doing YouTube. It is fantastic because there we are. Dad's off to do some scroll sorry. Um, yeah, the things that you develop by doing, you know, you learn about videoing, but you learn about different things when it comes to the actual woodworking itself. So I've learned methods and techniques and I constantly sort of challenge myself to improve because that's the idea is to try and make little improvements to learn new techniques to learn new methods and then to share them with everybody so hopefully hopefully it's useful to others as well good fun the couple who sat up next to me had a lot of wooden pieces and i kept hearing them say that all their work was handmade he neglected to mention the cnc he used <laughs> Oh, for loving it. All the while I was explaining that yes, everything on my, it was a bit frustrating. A bit frustrating? Honestly, that's, it's ridiculous. How can they claim, how can they claim that it's handmade? Since you use reclaimed wood, do you find older source wood easier and more difficult? Are they usually more dried out? Fantastic one, that one. You're not going anywhere for that. Um, to give, give us two minutes. Aubrey's just asked us a, a, a good onion. He's just asked about, because we use reclaimed woods, yeah. do we find older source wood easier or more difficult to work? Are they usually more dried out? It's a fantastic one, this. I right. would say they're easier. Depends. Oh, yeah. Right. Say. We had some woods. We, we can only go, go through examples. A lot of it comes down to where that wood has come from, yeah. what it's been used for. Yeah, okay, He's, Dad's gone to get some wood for you. We had some wood from our local church that, in fact, we sent a piece to the carver. So if you remember carving it, that stuff was 400 years old. That was challenging. But normally, what we find, what we find, because a lot of people would come in the workshop and they tell us, whoa, old oak, whoa, old oak is really... We actually find that a lot of old furniture oak carves really, really well, really nicely. So this is a difficult one for us to answer. And we've found some more modern stuff and things like that that's a lot more challenging. But there's that exception when it came to the wood that we had from the local church. It was challenging and it was completely different colour. But because it had been in a church, that particular little church, it would have been a bit damp and it may have been under stress. Also, it was used for something before it went in the church. So it could have been in a boat and then that's going to have an effect on it because it's under the stress of, of being out at sea and things like that. Yeah. That. yeah, that's the stuff there. And that was, we sent a bit to the carver. Oh, I remember carving it. That was an absolutely wonderful bit, bit to carve. Well, that is interesting because we found it challenging to carve yeah. and the carver found it nice. So this is what, this is what happens. Um, that was a farmhouse. Like oh, that's a farmhouse one. Oh, no, that's not the bit. That's... That was the bureau from the farmhouse. Ah, well, I was talking about the stuff from the church and the stuff from the church I found challenging. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. The carver found it nice. I yeah. found it more challenging. Yeah. Dad liked it. Um, but that, this, uh, oof, this was hard. Yeah, this yeah. was local, local oak yeah. bureau came from a farmhouse. Um, yeah, hard, hard stuff. Yeah. Uh, I had to firm some parts up. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So you had to stabilize it. Um, I think the answer to the question is, 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 is it's along those lines of don't judge a book by its cover yeah. until you've carved a piece yeah. of wood. I mean, Don't draw a, any conclusions. We've, we've got a, a fair bit of oak that we bought recently. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard stuff. Yeah. I think they, some of this, some of this I, must I be, some of this of, must be it, is yeah, it? A lot yeah. A of the um, furniture, the old furniture that we had. Oh, it's um, beautiful. Was some, some of it was European. Yeah. You know, and it's good stuff. So we've got, you know, you hear a lot of sweeping statements when it comes to wood and what makes a piece of wood good to work with or not so good to work with and things like this. 
our own thoughts on it is, you know, you can only really judge when you carve the individual piece of wood. And on top of that, different parts of the wood will carve differently than other parts of the wood. Um, so never sort of write anything in or anything out. And um, yeah, I personally would say when it comes to older or newer woods, I, I can't sort of give a, a definitive answer. Um, it's very much when I come to carve a piece of wood, then I make my assessment on it. Um, possibly doesn't help you too much, but that is, it's just something that I find that you have to judge. Don't judge a book by its cover either. It, just judge a piece of wood on its merits. It's probably again comes down to the lack of, um, sort of formal training and textbook training, that sort of thing, when it comes to wood carving. I, I've always been guided by the wood and that's the best teacher. Any other thoughts on, you know, wood age and things like that? Do you find that it's drier? I think some piece, it, a lot of it, again, it depends where it's been used, exactly. isn't it? I mean, Has it been under stress? I mentioned that I'd been in a farmhouse, you see. Could have been in the sun. It, no, I, I think it could have been stored somewhere. A, a little bit damp or something like that. Well, that's the thing. You know, damp. And you can see or, that's really old as well. Some people say it's old, funny, isn't it? It's the, the, no the, yeah. the noise. Yeah, the noise. It's really. Yeah. It'd yeah. polish. You polish this. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Hey, on the, on that say on that sort of subject, though, Dave. If you remember. Yeah. Um. Whoop, they, drop the they were. They were selling wood. Um, oh, is this something like from the Cutty Sark? It wasn't the Cutty Sark, I think it was it. Um, Nelson's flagship or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Can't even remember the name. Mary Rose? Was it? No, that was Henry VIII's, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure whether there, well, there was some firm... They sold, they sold it, it, was a, it must have been bigger than an ocean liner, yeah. wasn't it? There, there was some firm, <laughs> reckon they had timber from... Some sort of ancient ship or another. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and so you have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. On, on what you're actually buying then. That's maybe. right, yeah. Because um, uh, I, I, I do remember that was... Uh, but once you get into the antiques yeah. world, unless you oh, really know yeah. your stuff, you, yeah. you've got to be really careful. But you can really spin a yarn with timber. <laughs> I, mean, I think the best, I, one I, of the best we sold, stories... We sold a spoon this afternoon to, to a lady uh, on the coach. And I did tell us a story about that when it was from the pipeline. The LNG pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, so it, it can sort of... Um, it's Take cement victory. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they sell bits of the mast every few years as a fundraiser to maintain the ship. Very long mast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, on the... On the on the on the subject, the wood, yeah, it, you 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 can have all sorts. I think the one of the best stories locally for highlighting how you do have to have a bit of caution. I'm not saying they were doing anything wrong with the HMS Victory, by the way. I'm sure that is legit. Um, they had a thing locally, didn't they, down in Larn? I don't know if anybody else has heard of Dylan Thomas. Oh yeah, that's a cracking and, story. That and what they used to do down in Larn. They would have um, between, Dylan Thomas. Between Dylan Thomas, the poet, if anybody doesn't know. Well, basically, um, yeah, Dylan Thomas, an undermilk woods and very famous Welsh writer. And so um, he was he was very big in America, actually. So, you, you, you know, you, if you're stateside, you might have heard of Dylan Thomas. And um, as a result, in Lan, they used to get a lot of visitors from America. A lot of interest in Dylan Thomas. So what they would do in the one pub is um, if somebody came in and they thought they were a tour tourist, they were visitors, they would sit there and they would say, oh, can you um, say to the bartender, can you just pass me Dylan's kettle there? And so a conversation would be struck up. Hey, we, we may get in trouble now down in Lan. <laughs> they, I played rugby down there. We may have bought, they may be up here to speak to us. And what they what they would do see is they'd strike the conversation, and then the person would you know sort of say, "Is that Dylan Thomas's kettle?" And they say, "Oh yeah, yeah, this is Dylan Thomas's kettle." 
Well, basically, if they sold one kettle, they sold about 30, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's antiques. Got to be careful what you're buying. Uh, I had some and donated a piece of my old wardrobe from S years back. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, our experience, a lot of people when it came to the, the, the older woods, a lot of people avoid it. Because there's this reputation that, you know, like old oak is very hard and, you know, oh, so difficult to work through. Um, I, I find a lot of the time with it, a lot of it is talk. I just find you've got to judge the piece of wood on its merits. It's the same now. Teak, what a beautiful timber teak is to work with. But most people wouldn't even think about using it because we have the expression here as tough as teak. So it's a, a widely avoided timber um which is good for us in a way because we always we always like a piece of teak and um we use it for oh it, it's a really nice nice timber if you're a wood carver you've got to have a go at carving a piece of teak it is such a pleasure to work with different to a lot of other timbers but a, a lovely timber to work in that's a lot of it as well is being open to trying different timbers a lot of wood carving that I that I've seen, I would say the, the majority of carving is is done now in in basswood. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, which we refer to as flowering lime. I think that's how a lot of holy relics got their start. I think you're right there too. Yeah, I think there have been a few holy relics over the year uh, over the years. But that was the story locally in in Larne with Dylan Thomas. The only thing I ever remember of Dylan Thomas is his fictional village. I think it was called Claregab, which if you uh, write it down backwards, write down Claregab backwards, you'll, uh, you'll see uh, what, why people in, in, enjoyed his work. A lot of, lot of humour, a lot of silly nonsense, messing about, that sort of thing. A bit of... Uh, Welsh humour. So you can see we're well on now. We're just going to work on um, these hearts, that little little lines across the across the top. Saints with sixteen fingers must be a miracle. Saints with fifteen fingers. Oh, you, you'll you'll have to explain that one. That's gone over my head, now. Did they used to did they used to sell them the uh, saint's fingers? You'll have to explain. I'm a bit slow on that one, I'm afraid. So you can see we're just going to do that angle there over the top, and um, then afterwards we're going to shape the two hearts and then match it all back up afterwards. The only relics that I know of, that's locally, is um, is the ones with St. David. But again, whether there's um, the new from the same saint, right, I'm with you. Um, yeah, that's the only one I'm familiar with, but I'm not even, they, they, they say about it in the cathedral, but I don't know anything about the authenticity of those either. Creeps into love spoons. I said it before, there's a lot of early love spoons, a lot of claims of vintage love spoons, but true, true vintage love spoons are really expensive. You get them like, you'll see them selling at uh, Christie's or I think Sotheby's, places like that. You'll see love spoons being sold for up to £20,000. Reason for that is they're so unusual, they're so rare. But in more recent times, they're more common. Which is an interesting phenomenon. Going back as well on the uh, point where we we're talking about the tear out, like you can get tearing in and around the edges there, and it, again, a lot of that is down to tools, sharpness, quality of the tools. So it's well worth having a little look. 
have a look at the tools and check in that they are properly sharpened and doing the business. So we're just carving into that edge. It is coming along nicely there. Just giving it a little bit more depth. Just like so. Very interesting as well where my initial thoughts, okie dokie, that's just, that's just mum doing hand signals to tell me that she's put me a, a cup of tea there. Thank you very much. I will tell him too. She's done us a cup of tea there. Ready for our tea break. So we, yeah. Um, interestingly, with this particular one, it shows you there's a bit more carving to this one than I was initially sort of anticipating. So I thought we would have been through this one quite quickly, but it just shows you how you can underestimate the work involved. A lot of little bits of, you know, detail, shaping, that sort of thing. But it's come along nicely. Other ones then we've been working on, we've done one, I think I mentioned it last week, Castle Cork. We've also then as well been um, quite a few different scroll saw projects that I've been doing. I um, actually got one, I thought this would be really nice. Um, I haven't started filming it. I've prepared the wood, what it is, for one of the scroll saw projects that I did, I um, I made an, a carve, I, 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 sorry, a scroll saw project with um, an eagle, and I used different colours, and I thought that would be a really nice video, that is to do all um, bird themed projects, so that's one that I'm going to be filming, is different, different birds, and the reason I'm using that as well, my sons the school they go to all of the classes are named after different birds so they've got a the, the 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 school logo itself has got a heron on it um they've got a swan class a robin class a kingfisher class and a barn owl class so we've got all those birds we're going to turn into scroll saw projects so i'm looking forward to that It'll be a bit of fun oh, uh, do you prefer a stone synthetic or natural or a strop for sharpening or combine the two? Right, uh, we've got a tall mech, so that is our preferred method when it comes to the sharpening. Yeah, with the with the um, tall mech, you've got the three parts to it. You've got the whetstone, you've got the honing wheels, and you've got the stropping wheels. So we're basically sharpening on the external angle. So use the stone to sharpen on the external angle. You get a little burr on the inside. So use the honing wheels to take off the burr. And then they sell, Tormex sell a um, honing paste. And so you put a little bit of the honing paste and then polish the metal. So it's a sort of three part system with the Tormex. Really good system though. If that one there, the Tormex, it is a bit, pricey to say the least so it is a bit expensive and so there are other companies like in the UK here Axminster they do a version and there are different sharpening systems again though if you're not looking to sort of invest big in that way you can do some pretty decent sharpening just using a little slip stone or an oil stone like that one there so you can use oil stones and slip stones. The only thing we always say, if you're using oil stones and slip stones, um, have a different wheel, um, have a different, we uh, sorry, have a different stone for doing your straight chisels and curved gouges. Because eventually the curved gouges put a curve in the stone and it causes you problems. Hello, Sammy. Hello. Boys are back from school. Indeed as well, Dad's trousers are the preferred method for stropping, but you can buy a leather strop um, but he's always tearing his trousers, doing that. Did you have a good day in school, Sammy? Yeah. Good, good. Glad to hear it. So, yeah, those are some of the methods you can use. Um, have a little look on the channel as well. There's a few different demonstrations of the process that we use. But sharpening, yeah, definitely 
comes into it. And again, it's the quality of steel of the tools that you're working with, they make a difference too. So check it all out. Um, we used to exclusively use oil stones, slip stones, that sort of thing, and then just strop the metal on a piece of material. That was our method of using it. And then the one day dad said he was buying a tall mech and he told me the price and I thought, wow, you must be mad, our tools are sharp. As soon as he bought it and we started using it, I understood why he bought it because it is a fantastic piece of equipment for sharpening. But it is a big outlay initially and you've got to learn how to use it properly. So, there's a bit, you're, you're, you're investing. Oops, you're investing a lot into it in terms of uh, money and also time. Hello, sir. Hello. Here comes Nico. No, you're welcome. Thank you, Dee. Thanks for uh, joining us. Nico's here now. How's school today, Nico? Fine. Good, good. I mean, I have been a little bit of their corn. No problem at all. You carry on then, Nico. So we're carving a spoon today, Nico. What's it got on it? Come and tell everyone what it looks like. What does that look like? Oh. oh dear, I got some work to do. We got silence from him. Come, a come flower here. and a bee. Ah, yeah, it's a flower and a bee. There we are. Can you see it better from this angle? Yeah, if you sit up there. Can you see it? Yeah. There we are. I'm happy with that. Nico knew what it was. Good man. Yeah, but first I didn't really see it properly. Properly. Watch the tripod. There we are. So you've been busy in school today? Yeah. Did you know bees actually have five eyes? Five eyes? Yeah. And we're going to get five eyes on there, Nico. I don't know. Oh dear. We'll have to find a way. I think I'm going to try and get one at the front. It's what we call artistic license. <laughs> Those are two other eyes. Two extra eyes? Yeah. We'll, we'll use a bit of artistic license, we will. That's what we'll have to do, Nico. Sammy, you're putting up the slippery sign, are you? Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. And what did you do in school today, Sammy? Was it PE today? Yeah. Good, good. Someone said um, um, to their mum that it wasn't PE. Oh, dear. Did they have no PE, PE uh, what do you call it, PE kit? So you see we've just taken out that little bit of wood. This one here in terms of doing the trumpet on the, the daffodil, a little bit more demanding because we've got those legs. But you just push them back, push them out the way. You know today we were learning about harvest. You had your harvest festival, did you, in, um, in, in school? Well, and Sammy was, Sammy was You only need two and a half eyes if only one side. Ah, there we are. We only, Aubrey's pointed out, we can only see one, one half of it, see? So we only need two and a half, because the other two and a half eyes are on the other side of his head. There we are. Well, that'll help out, won't it? What do you think, Nico? That'll help us out a bit. Yeah. What I'm, I'm going to do with this one, same as we did before, we're going, to, we're going to cheat a bit. We're going to give one eye at the front of the bee. And then we're just going to finish off with little bits of detail on the daffodil itself. I'm going to push the trumpet back a little bit, give it that impression that it's more sort of three quarter angle. There's, there's more than one way of seeing trumpet. That's just the flower one. There's another trumpet. You know where they blow them? Stylized bee, indeed. Yeah, and. Um, you know when What's they blow, um, you know the musical instrument? Trumpet? There's a musical instrument called a trumpet, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it gets its name from the, from the daffodil. What do you think? Well, they do look similar. Because that's what they call it on a daffodil. What came first? The trumpet or the daffodil? The daffodil because it's a plant. There we are. Did you know ants have been around since dinosaurs? Really? Yeah. They've been known to be killing dinosaurs. 
killed a dinosaur? What do you mean? Yeah, they have killed many dinosaurs. That means they can also defeat and kill a human. Oh, you'd have to be careful of those ants. Right, so you can see we're putting a little bit of detail, Nico. Can you see? A little bit of detail on the daffodil. Yeah. Finishing it off. Did you did you eat as well? Did you eat all of your lunch? Um, no. I can tell you why. Um, after this video, because I don't think the people watching would want to know. Oh dear! I made you the bread. Look, here's Yelly now, and she's found my mask that I lost. There we are. Brilliant. I found doody, my mask. Doody. What my last was... I remember the word could be Daddy. Gwen. Gwenene, which kind of sound, sounds like a bee. Well, I always remember that, I always remember honey in Welsh, mel, pur mel. Um, and honey in Spanish and is miel. Is miel, that's right, and that's how I always remember it, because it's miel in, in Spanish, and it's mel in Welsh. So I remember that one. Similar, isn't it, Nico? That's right. So you can see what we're doing now, just to finish off, we're going to bevel around the edges of the heart. For the eye of the bee, we're just going to put a little mark in just towards the front. Just a little bit of a mark in, just like so. So that'll, that little bit of detail hopefully will come out when we shellac it. And we see, we see if that's going to do the job okay. If not, We'll just change change our plan, carve it all a bit deeper, and just change it later on. As Dad always says, it's an impression. That's what you're going for. An impression of a bee. There we go. A little bit of detail in there. Finish off that bee. So that'll be the bee done, the daffodil done. You're back again. I know. I'm now going to have the sandwich. You're now going to have your sandwich. You were supposed to have that for your lunch. And now it's nearly four o'clock. You're having a late lunch, Nico. Fair enough. So you can see we just finish off beveling that edge. Round like so. And around just like so. Now there, now you talk about tear out, there's a little bit of tear out going on there. I tell you why, there's a little knot there. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change over, so it's methods that we use, I'm gonna change over to a smaller gouge. I don't know why, but that'll cut it a bit more cleanly. Something to do with surface areas probably, or that that gouge is just a fraction sharper. So we're just getting a little bit of what you were referring to as tear out there. So we change the gouge, problem solved. It's only because there's a knot there. See these little methods that we use like that, and you don't even know that you know it. It's just an instinctive thing when you carve. I always know that that gouge is just a fraction sharper or just a, cuts a fraction cleaner. I don't know why just does. So I just change over to that particular one. I don't know, I'll put it open to everyone. Do you find similar things that you'll have a particular gouge that you, we refer to certain gouges as go-to gouges. So if we're in a, a, bit of, a bit of trouble, we use those ones and they'll get us out of trouble. And it's just, again, a lot of it's sort of experience and time. Spending that time working with a gouge, learning what its sort of strengths are and how to use it best. Because the one I'm working with, the big one, lovely gouge, and I do a lot of the bulk of the work, but if I need something really sharp, then it's not always the best choice. Probably, because it's is constantly in use, this one. It does so much of the work that, you know, it loses its edge. Only a fraction, 
not that you would you know you wouldn't notice it for instance in the live stream that it's not as sharp but it's just when you have a little bit of a tricky patch like I had there with the knot it makes a difference all right so just carving right the way around the outside change over again to our other gouge just because the the bigger one is a bit wide got a greater chance of slipping into slipping into that top piece and that we are pretty much there for this particular blood spoon now what i'm going to do as promised we're going to go on to that other spoon and we're going to demonstrate how to do the the celtic eternity sign the eternity knot i've forgotten b you gave it a different name i tend to lean a lot more towards my three three mil so three mils would be one two three v so that one there something along those lines or possibly smaller than that something like that useful for certain things for specific things um we use it for we use the the v gouge for um a couple of things the tops of tudor roses that sort of thing and we use it for sort of grooving lines out that that sort of idea great for grooving out lines there we are so you can see that's where we got up to yeah it's making progress. I still got a bit of work in the bowl, but for now we're going to go on to our eternity sign on the top of here. Now the process with this one, something we carve regularly, and what we're trying to create. Um, yeah, now the the V gouge is useful. Not ones that we use a huge amount, but that's individual. That comes to our style of carving, what we do, how we do it. So to demonstrate this one. You start off with your stop cut. So you've got the stop cut down into the woods, over to the other side, and we do another stop cut on the other side, just like so. So that gives us the overall shape. Now, the way this one would be done, if I'm carving it as I normally would, I would then do the stop cuts for the heart for the top part because giving a little bit of depth around here is going to make it easier to cut into our stop cut for the eternity sign at the top this one as well actually was um, it's a redesign my original version of this i did uh, i basically did the whole spoon but smaller and then dad used to complain at me that he found it a bit tricky for scroll sawing so I redesigned it and made the whole thing bigger so that was how it came about this particular design it's an enlarged version of the original that I designed one of my one of the earlier ones actually that I did design the reason I've done all of those stock cuts then I'll do it on the hearts by here as well it just makes it easier to cut into there so that's the that's the method behind the madness. So we've got the shape then of our two hearts. And we're gonna use this gouge here. And we're just gonna bevel the inside of here. That needs and we're straight away, we've changed wood. And this one feels a little bit more challenging for carving than the other one. This is the wood that Dad referred to earlier. Some new oak that we have had in recently. And it certainly is a little bit more challenging, a bit more physical when it comes to the carving than the other ones that we've done. Now there, that's... Is that what you would call tear out? Where the little chunk came off. Simple reason, we're working in and around knots. So 
So it comes off in a chunk. I tend to be quite good at covering up where the grain sort of tears like that. There's little, there's little, little techniques that we just use. You know, rocking, you rock the gouge in like that. It just covers it up a little bit. A lot of it is just time, spending time with your gouges, a little bit tearing in by there. So we're tearing up the grain, but this is during the process. So I can clean all of this up afterwards. See, so is that what you're referring to with tear out, where you can see that's tearing? So basically, as that starts to tear in that way, yeah, you'll, you'll notice with me, I tend not to worry about it. This side will be fine because of the nature of the, that grain is going slightly off at an angle. Right, brilliant. Glad it's an example, we can show you what we do. So, that's starting to tear. So simple reason for it is because the grain is starting to pull. It's the direction of that grain, there you go, see? So that wants to pull up in a big splinter. So, what are we gonna do about it? First thing, Main thing we're gonna do, we're gonna cut this flat. We've got an example of tear out there. Yeah. Yeah, so we can demonstrate now what, what we do. So we start to get the depth here. That's how hard up in there. Yeah, getting a, getting a bit of a sweat on now carving this. It's, it's a bit of graft. So we're going to carve into those edges, okay? That's the first thing. So we get our depth into our eternity sign. And literally, the reason in this, and you do get tear out for different reasons, which is one thing we've um, sort of suggested. And all I would do to deal with this particular one, a lot of it then is understanding what has caused the tear out, what has caused that splinter to come up. And so all I'm going to do, we're going to work in this direction. We get the depth and I'm going to turn it round then in the vise. And that's going to be how I deal with the tear out. But again, you get different, it happens for different reasons. And that's what you sort of develop as you, as you do more carving, you know, as you're learning and things like that. So can you see, there's that splinter there. Hmm? Can you see? Ah, so it yeah. wants to pull. Ah, yeah, yeah, wants to pull out. Now. So we're going to go back the other way. Yeah. Problem solved. Can you see as well? That's that's loop to loop there. You can see it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's tough stuff. Our local oak is a bit tougher than most of the oak that we have here. Because we're quite near the coast, the you often see the oak trees. We well, see a lot of trees around here. They're sort of leaning over, and. Um, they're, they're sort of three quarters leaning over. So now some people may be, you know, if you've learned from a textbook, that would be going against your instinct because the textbook is telling you to carve the other way. I don't know, it, it just, when you hit that point, yeah, brilliant, thanks. There's, there's kind of what we refer to as a, as a critical point where the, the grain starts going in the opposite direction. And that is what is causing the, the tear out on that one there is where the grain is just going in the opposite direction. And it's because it's going across at an angle, so we, we go past that critical point, turn it round in the vise, sort it out. And then tidy up any stray little bits. So this is, you know, this is the, the story and the process of your carving, because I know what's happened there. Whoever buys this love spoon will never know, you know, that we had to do that to get a cleaner finish and to solve the problem. This side, completely different because that, that grain is just starting to go at a slight angle. And it was, I tell you why it's doing this is because I had to mark it out with the grain going at a slight angle because um, I was fitting two love spoons onto one piece of wood and there wasn't quite enough space to fit them in with the grain going straight. 
So sometimes you have to compromise to fit them on the piece of wood. And the compromise was to just angle this one across a little bit. It was marked out, I do believe, yeah, it was marked out at the same time as this one. So these two love spoons were marked out on the piece of wood like that. And the reason somewhere along there, I can't remember exactly, may have been there. Um, the reason that I chose to angle that grain was because I was taking a bit of a chance on that piece of wood anyway. And I thought, well, if we get anything out of this spoon, great. If it doesn't work out, there we are. We've, we've had a go. We've given it a chance. So the way we create the effect of the over and under. Try to get up any last little stray pieces. And the same on the other side. The way we create that effect. We go over and under and over again. So it's deciding which bit, and with the way I do things, I always have um, that piece go in over there. So it's always this piece goes over, and then I can work it out from doing my first cut. I work out where all the other stop cuts go. I think as well, when it comes to these questions, you know, things like tear out and where you have problems like that, um, it's trust in your material, it's trust in yourself, and it's trust in your tools. And again, that, that just comes with time. And it's not to say we get it right every time. Sometimes we get, you know, you try and sort the problem, you'll make it worse, and you'll have to go back, come back again, and try again, and find a solution. So we just got those stop cuts and we create that effect of over and under and over and under that continuous weaving type effect and you notice what i do with that i start off on the corner here and i kind of roll the gouge so i'm carving with the grain as much as possible so that's you know, that is what you ultimately want to be doing as much as possible, is to carve with the grain. Same, start off on that and roll it. Roll your gouge. Roll the gouge. So you're just rolling it sort of around the corner. Just means that you get a cleaner cut. So I'm starting off on that left-hand corner. Roll it around. Roll it around. Try and just roll the gouge so you get a cleaner cut. Roll the gouge round the corner, turn it round in the vise, and back the other way. And you're just pushing that down into that stop cut. And the main thing, always remember, enjoy the process, enjoy the carving, enjoy the wood, enjoy it for what it is. Things will go wrong from time to time, but that's the uh, the process of learning. And the best teacher I've, I've ever had, and I've, grow, I've grown up around it, and I've had a lot of help, you know, in, in terms of dad would have been here to help out in certain things, but the best way of learning is the wood itself. If you're open to learning from the wood, it'll teach you best practice and how, how to work with it. So we're just using the reverse angles on the gouge, just to get a nice clean cutting edge. Where we've got those little bits of wood left over, just re-establish that stop cut. So just cut further down into the wood like so and so we're trying to get the same sort of depth on both sides so we're trying to get similar depth here and here so it's that matching it up on both sides turn it around again And just cutting into into that stop cut 
So what ends up happening is I end up going below the stop cut where I'm cutting out. So I re-establish stop cut. And go back in. And now this one here, this one we're going to be going across the grain. So again, you may get a bit of tear, tear out on here. And we'll show you how we sort of manage how we manage that. Just cleaning up the edge there. All right, so what I will do with this one, I'll cut it differently. So I'll rock my gouge from side to side. I'll take out smaller chunks, bit by bit by bit. So it'll actually, instead of carving as I normally would, where I take a lot out, you can rock the gouge as well from side to side, try different methods like that, see what works. Re-establish the stop cut. So what I did see is I got I started off more closely here to get the depth, and then I went further back afterwards because we don't want we want the minimal amount of tearing as we're going across the grain. That is definitely where a good gouge comes into its own. There we are. Just want a nice clean, this is one naughty piece of wood, won't come out, it's gone. So it's just creating that depth. Perhaps that one needs to push down a little bit further. Um, that one, not too bad, just needs a bit of cleaning up in the stop cut. And this one, pretty good too. So, finishing off now. Concentrating on the sort of finishing stages, we use our gouge, again going with the grain. Now I already I've read the grain that if I go if I go in that corner there, we're gonna get tear out because we're going past that critical point. So I will come back the other way. This one should be fine. So this is where as well, grain reading, reading the grain. Look at your grain, look at what that wood is showing you, look at what it's teaching you. And always remember, whilst I say that, there's always an exception to the rule because there are those mahoganies, as we mentioned, that carve backwards. So here we just carve a little bit of, just bevel that edge slightly. Same again with this one. And I'm going to finish off this one, but I'll show you what, how to finish off this eternity sign, first of all. So again, there you, you, you use, you just use the grain to your, 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 your best. Let that wood guide you. So this piece here, see, better to carve it this way because that's just at the critical point where the grain goes from the one direction to the other direction. So because we're just beyond that critical point, it's a cleaner cut if we go this way. If I'd have carried on, if I'd have carried on and tried to carve this the other way, you'd have got tear out. This one here you'd have ended up tearing the grain because you're not working you're not working in the best direction for the wood and again i'm not sure if in terms of textbooks they'd probably tell you that's wrong and my argument would be that sorry that that's it isn't wrong because it works in practice might not be right in theory but it works in practice now this here again that's going to be a candidate, well it is, it's, you're starting to get tear out, okay? So, instead of carrying on with your cuts, turn it back round, carve it back the other way to avoid tearing, clean a cut. And that comes down to experience and reading the grain. So instead of just continuing with your cuts, look at the grain, 
what's the wood telling me? Feel the grain as well. You can actually feel the grain, what it's, what is it actually, what's the feel of the grain? Is it starting to feel different? Is it starting to feel as if you're not getting a smooth cut? That's what the grain's telling you. Listen to it, take it on board. So once we get to there, I'm getting resistance, too much resistance, not happy with it. So I'll cut it back the other way. We just finish these runs before we turn it around again. So how to reduce, because you won't eliminate tear out, but you can reduce it. And a lot of it, it does come down to interacting with the material. Don't try and sort of have, I don't know, some sort of macho dominant idea. I'm going to dominate the material. I'm going to, it's going to do what I want it to do. No, you have to be sympathetic and you have to work with it. You have to work with it. And if you work with it, it'll help you out. There you go, see? So completely against instinct in some ways because you're going the wrong way. That's what the wood's telling me. You won't win an argument with it, so work with it. Same, working on the top there, just beveling that edge. Oh, thank you, Dee. I, uh, yeah, much appreciated. Thanks for the positive feedback on that one. It's, that's, that's what you're, you know, that those are the sorts of things that you're looking for, looking to avoid. Um, and it's getting that feeling for, for the wood. Um, yeah, hopefully it is useful for you because as you probably well know, it's a lovely process, wood carving. And if you can eliminate sort of any frustrations. So there's two things. One with that particular type when it comes to the tear out. One is, is how you've marked it. So ideally I'd have marked it completely straight. It's not always possible though. It's not always practical. And then the other is when you start to feel the resistance of the woods. Follow what it says. Now sometimes we get it on this when you're just finishing off here and we may get it on the other side where that knot is because there is a little bit of tear out that I can see here needs finishing off and it's literally because it's in the worst possible place because there's two little knots so the grain will be going in different directions. It's a lot of it, see, it comes down to it's the love for the for the um, nature always wins. Yeah, spot on. Um, yeah, and that is a big part of it. Like for instance there, I can feel straight away, I go to start carving, I'm not happy with the amount of resistance there. So if I carry on, I'm gonna take a big splinter out of it. So come further down the piece of wood, there you go, straight away, that knot has come completely out, which I'm quite glad about. I'm glad it's coming straight out. But it means there's a little chunk of wood that comes out. So how do we sort of remedy it? We just make this piece the easier side. We make that a bit deeper to match it up. So that's the first thing I'm doing. Match this up. Very fortunate actually with this live stream I am because um, this is actually the perfect spoon because of the way it's been marked out, because of the way I marked it out yesterday. It's perfect for the, the question you've asked earlier. So it's worked out well. Um, so, yeah, back to this side. And that's where we're working out. Where does that grain change? Because it's basically, you've got all those fibers of the grain lined up. And there's a critical point that you reach where the grain starts going in the opposite direction. And so it is reading that grain. See there, that's where the knot is. So, We've got to figure out the best way of cleaning that up. And normally, I, I'm doing these things in the live stream and I, I, I sort of just 
gloss gloss over them in some ways because we you know different different times we're looking and talking about different things so it's a fantastic question you've asked us because it really gets us to focus in on that one specific aspect so really yeah uh, it is something that i would suggest would be relevant to a wood carver of any experience ability level because we do these things on a daily basis and we don't even think about what we're doing there you go so again we're working in that knot and knots are always a little bit challenging so you're getting that resistance from the wood so let's have a little look now we're in the realms of how are we going to get the cleanest finish where that knot was. So it's not, pardon my bones. This is where that particular tear out that's in and around the knot, we've just got to make the best of it. And what I would do, and I will show you how I will make the best of it. Yeah, we just take our little chunk. What it is, the because it's a knot, because there was a knot there, which we've now eliminated, the grain is actually going in two directions. So we go clean up the rest of it, and then it's going to be down to sandpapers to tidy it up. Here then, see, because the grain has gone past that critical point, we've gone past where the fibres are running in the one direction, the fibres are now running in the opposite direction. So it's a roundabout here, they start running in the opposite direction. So that's why I've turned it around and I'm working with the grain still. There you can see, that's the point that the grain flips around, goes in the opposite direction again. Reading the wood, letting the, the wood guide you. It's basically, it's like the wood's holding, holding your hand and showing you the way to go. It's like, it's like, here we are, we get, we start to sound, I'm starting to sound a bit too much like a, a bit too hippie-ish, a bit too sort of um, heat, the, the, the tree hugging, but it is literally like going on a journey and the wood, it sort of holds your hand through the journey and says, no, this is the direction to go. This is the direction you go. And that is the biggest sort of asset then a wood carver has got. Is, is the wood itself, if you're open to it and you're listening and it's saying, no, 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 that's the wrong way. That's the wrong way, that's the wrong way. It'll keep telling you, no, wrong way, no, wrong way. Take it on board, say, okay, fair enough, that's what you're telling me, I'll follow what you're saying. So it's, it's sort of, um, what's the word? A wood disciple, rename the channel wood disciples it's it's following what it's telling you it, it very much it's proved very interesting this one did yeah well because we, we're talking about this tear out and on this particular piece see i have to mark it out with a slightly diagonal grain and i just say there's there's things here that i don't think i may be wrong they probably do teach it in in the textbook but we've had to constantly change because of the constant changes in this grain and with the knots and things like that and it's how the wood, it's like going on a journey, it's like the wood shows you yeah. the way to go. I mean, fair as you're carving it, or I mean, you know what I'd have done? You'd probably, put I don't know, sand put it on sand or something like that, yeah. Um, but there we are. Hopefully that's useful to you all. Right, so, where you've got it left over now on the edges, where there's a little bit of afterwards now, see, I'm just going to sand it all out. Do you want the shellac as well, just, just, just show everybody the grain? Yeah, why not? Why not? So where there was that knot, it's good because one of one of the knots has completely now gone. So that's gone out of the, the carving. And in fact, two of the knots, two of the knots on the, um, on the outside, they're now completely eliminated from the face, which is the main thing that people look at. So a bit of, bit of elbow grease. I know you probably look and think, oh, you should be using a block. Yeah, 
I know, but I'm just mainly trying to take that little knot out. That little knot there, just where it was a tricky little piece of grain. There we are. Yeah, hopefully that's been interesting. Hopefully it's useful. I've certainly enjoyed it. And um, the questions and the comments are much appreciated because it gets us thinking. It gets us thinking ourselves about things that we're constantly doing. And often we don't even think about it. We don't actually give it much thought. But to have that question put to you, it gets you thinking yourself about what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. It's still the tiniest, tiniest little bit, but we can get that out afterwards. But all we'll do to finish off, we put a coat of shellac on it, just so everybody can see the sort of finished. Once you put the shellac on as well, you can barely even notice it. Yes, I like it all. You still see that knot on the back there. I'm not going to do the back of the bowl because there's a mark on there, so that's going to that would push the mark further in. I'm not going to do the front of the bowl either because there's a mark there as well. So we get rid of those before we do. So there we are. That was the little difficult bit of grain there. Still a little bit of work on it, but pretty much done and then that's the eternity sign and there we have our busy bee on the bower there we are yeah all about as you said problem solving process that's wood carving basically that's what we're constantly doing seeking out what needs to be done following what the wood's telling us any issues that you get let the wood direct you let the wood give you the direction let it really guide you in the direction you should go. Thank you as always for joining us. Really appreciate that. Uh, hope everyone has a good week. Hope that's useful. Uh, as always, Wednesday, we'll have a, a video upload. Um, we've been doing some different filming again, so we'll have all sorts of uh, different stuff. Yeah, coming up on the channel. Thanks as always for, for supporting us and um, all going well. We'll be back next Monday. Thank you all again.